Hi, everybody, and welcome to our Hapara Expert Learning Webinar Series. We are joined today by Shaylin Farnsworth. Um, and by the way, my name is Beth Still, and I am the Professional Learning Manager here at Hapara. And one of the fun, amazing things I get to do is I get to talk to experts from around the world in all sorts of different fields. And one of the things we really wanted to do was connect with an expert on feedback. And I couldn't think of anybody better to fill that spot than Shaylin Farnsworth. I have known Shaylin since about 2014. We were in the Google Teacher Academy together way back in 2014. Um, and we like to say we kind of broke their model because that was the last um, time they actually had a Google Teacher Academy and then it moved on to some other things. So anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and let Shaylin talk a little bit about herself and then we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks, Beth. Um, oh my gosh, it has been such a long time um, that we met at the, the Google Teacher Academy and we did break the mold. Um, hello everyone, I'm Shaylin Farnsworth. I'm a literacy consultant in Iowa. I focus on literacy, technology, school improvement, systemic change, so a variety of things. Um, I was a classroom teacher for a very long time um, and then I worked for a region in the state supporting districts in, in various um, school improvement initiatives, implementation, all those types of things. So I have a wide variety, um, uh, a repertoire of different education things that I know, but one thing that I'm passionate about is feedback. And um, I was able uh, last year to a a attend a, a learning conference with John Hattie. Um, and that's where I dug into feedback and, and it's become kind of my jam, um, especially being a writing teacher, Beth. Uh, but I also know that Hapara, uh, a lot of their model is based on the work of John Hattie. So what's that connection there? Yeah, so um, 10 years ago, Hapara is 10 years old this year, so happy birthday, Hapara. Um, when <coughs> Hapara was first born, if you will, um, they wanted to do something more than just make a tool um, just to kind of, you know, allow teachers to close students out of their work and things like that. They really wanted to make a tool that was meaningful. And so Hapara was born on the work of, um, based on the work of John Hattie. Um, and his visible learning. And that's really what Hapara does best. It, it surfaces learning, it makes it, makes it much easier for teachers to go in and see what their students are doing, and also to jump into things like Google Docs and interact with them and really kind of keep that feedback loop going and not just have feedback be the grade at the end. And I know you're gonna talk about that today, how that's really not necessarily feedback. So um, I'll let you go in and do your thing and I'm looking forward to learning with you for the next 45 minutes or so. All right, awesome, thank you. Um, so that's right, as Beth said, we are gonna talk about feedback today and the title is Punctuating Feedback to Maximize Student Achievement. And it is based on um, um, research, but uh, again, a little bit about me. Um, I'm Shaylin Farnsworth and uh, Here's my information. Like I said, I am in Iowa, so it's freezing right now um, in, in Iowa. And uh, I, I tweet regularly. I think that is initially how Beth and I met long before the Google Academy. You can follow me on Twitter at SH Farnsworth. I share a lot of ed tech, a lot of literacy, a lot of reading and writing, um, school improvement, so a variety of things. And also I have a, a website and I blog regularly. Um, so you can check me out at shaylinfarnsworth.com. It has all my contact information. Any other resources you need from this webinar or you wanna connect about anything else, let me know, I am happy to help. So that is my information and uh, let's dig in. Uh, so if you look at um, history, not very long ago, feedback was a term we rarely heard in education. It was typically called grading or marking as they call it in, in other countries rather than the US. Um, it was a typical way that teachers responded to students and it usually happened at the very end. So they received their grades or their marks. Well, Ruth Butler did a study, and this was in 1988, and she looked at a group of students, um, and students were given one of the following, grades, comments only, or both grades and comments. And she looked at which students' um, uh, achievement rose based on uh, on what they received on their, you know, paper, exam, whatever it may be. Um, any guesses on what that would be? 
I am going to just guess that it would probably be grades and comments. Grades and comments. Now you would think that, but actually what she found in her study, it was comments only. Um, which is kind of surprising, but they found that grades did very little. Um, comments moved everyone forward and increased student achievement. The interesting thing that I, th that I thought as well was her survey showed that when students received both grades and comments, they tossed out the comments because usually they were um, fluffy and, uh, you know, talking about the awesomeness that the, the student did and what they did well. And so they felt like it was more um, feeding their ego rather than providing them uh, feedback to move them forward. So actually that, the, that group uh, increased the least um, in student achievement. So it's a very interesting uh, study that she did. Um, uh, but that's really where the term feedback first came on the scene in education was this, this study that, that Ruth Butler um, did. So I typically start with, what do you mean by feedback? So if you ask uh, a group of teachers, describe feedback, right? What do you mean by feedback? How would you define it? You typically get one of these answers, and I love it, um, because they all start with C, right? Alliteration um, for my literacy buffs out there. But typically, you hear feedback described as comments or clarification. Um, maybe it's cons and pros or correction criterion um, which is familiar with rubrics so you typically hear one of these one of these um, one of these terms being used uh, to describe feedback but what Hattie and Shirley Clark did was decided to look at feedback because it was so variable um, and and ask themselves what makes feedback effective so we know that teachers across the country have different ways to describe feedback, but what makes it most effective? They knew it went across disciplines, they knew it went across grade spans, they knew from different surveys, especially in studies from the Ruth Butler one, that comments and feedback propelled students forward in their, in their student achievement, but not all feedback is created equal. And so they ask themselves, what makes it effective? And that's where you come into the meta-analysis and all of the study on research that John Hattie has done. And what he has created is he looks at what increases student achievement in schools. Um, things teachers do, things students do, the environment, things in our control, outside of our control, and he ranked them according to an effect size. Point four was what he called the hinge point. So anything above a point four means that there's a direct correlation between that component, in this case feedback, and increasing in student achievement. Anything under a point four, you couldn't make that direct connection um, or that correlation. But point four and above, the hinge point, he said, this definitely has some impact on student achievement. Feedback, as you can see here, has an effect size of 0.73, meaning that there's huge gains in student achievement when feedback is done correctly. And it's effective feedback or it's punctuating feedback, as uh, John Hattie and Shirley Clark state. So I love that. Um, as I said before, it's applicable across disciplines and grades, meaning no matter what grade level you teach, all the way from K to grade 12, uh, feedback increases student achievement no matter what content area as well. But as I said earlier, they noticed that not all feedback is created equally. It is variable. It's ambiguous when you ask people to define feedback. So they set out um, looking at all of these studies and defining um, and uh, creating a culture of support for feedback in the classroom. So this diagram, um, as you can see here, this, this infographic on the side shows you uh, different effect sizes for um, components when looking at Hattie's research. And you'll see feedback is right underneath reciprocal teaching um, with a 0.73. Uh, I also find it interesting that if you look at all of the research and studies, it talks about how many times a student needs to be exposed to content before learning it, and it's three to five times being exposed to new content. Um, so feedback is really about closing the gap between 
current and desired learning. So when they're initially learning something new, all the way to that third, fifth exposure, that feedback in between there helps students uh, reach that learning goal. Um, but as I said earlier, they knew um, that not all feedback was created equally. Uh, they don't need, students don't need just repeated um, exposure to the same tasks. It's kind of like uh, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. It doesn't work. So they knew that they had to focus in on feedback, what makes feedback um, effective, and how can we create a culture in our school, in our buildings, in our districts um, to support that feedback culture. So this is what they came up with. And if you look at feedback um, collectively uh, in, in all of the papers, the studies, the research, all the books written about it, they typically boil down to these three things. First, effective feedback has to have time for students to process the information. Coming at the very end as a grade does nothing to increase student achievement or learning. Second, Kids have to know how to interpret that feedback. So what does it mean when you're providing feedback on their papers, um, on their, their short answers, on their classroom discussions? So understanding how to interpret that feedback and uh, moving forward, um, time for them to process. And finally, it's a classroom culture to support that skills learn from the feedback. So do we have a culture that supports that? So most people understand that, yes, kids need time to process. Um, feedback is best given during the learning process, not at the very end. They have to understand what skills and how to interpret the feedback. But a lot of people are, are confused about how to create a culture of feedback in the classroom or in the district or school. And so that's what um, we're going to look at uh, throughout this webinar. It's the greatest impact occurs when it's supported by an effective teaching and learning strategy. So creating a holistic culture that supports that learning. Maximizing the feedback in the classroom. So here it is, the seven ideas. So we already know the three components for feedback. It has to be um, specific. There has to be time for, for kids to process and it has to set with in a culture of feedback that maximizes the learning. So here are seven ideas for that maximization. First, it sits within a formative assessment framework. Um, next, internally motivated to promote curiosity. Third, it's embedded in challenging mindsets and mind frames. There's deliberate practice. Uh, fourth, air is normal and celebrated in the classroom. Um, next, equity in learning is maximized through mixed ability group. And we're gonna go into that a little bit later, Beth. Um, next is feedback needs to be task oriented rather than ego related. So focusing on the task, not on the ego. And finally, it's underpinned in the belief that all students can approve. So that's what it looks like to maximize it. Looking at them one by one, the first one is students set within a formative assessment framework. It includes where to next and how to improve. It helps teachers adjust their teaching and it depends upon this information. I like to look at formative assessment as a bottom level in a data pyramid. So if you look at how students are assessed in a typical school or district, at the very top point of the pyramid, you have those high stake testing. So like state exams, um, standardized tests, uh, followed by benchmark assessment. Um, maybe you have some uh, unit test or large um, end of the year projects. All the way down to the very bottom, the base of the pyramid, you have formative assessment. And what formative assessment is at its root is responsive teaching. And uh, it typically happens multiple times throughout a class, uh, a class period. It can be both um, analog and digital. So you could do a raising of a hand or you could have some feedback through an exit ticket that might be something digital. Um, or maybe it might be a, a conversation, but that formative assessment, what they have found is increases student achievement most. So don't get upside down in that data pyramid. 
focus on the bottom layer, that responsive teaching, that formative assessment embedded within your classroom to directly change your instruction. And that's what makes formative assessment so powerful. We could do a whole other webinar on formative assessment, but again, it's just in time, it's during the class, it could be analog or digital. It helps change your instruction um, to meet the needs of students. And big one, it's not graded. Formative assessment is not graded. It is to gauge what students are learning in the classroom. So that's the first, uh, first component. Here we go, second component. There's an internal motivation to promote curiosity and willingness to learn. So active involvement by students in their own learning and recognizing the growth from where they began to where they are now. It's not a comparison student to student. It's a comparison of growth. So how much um, did they grow from the beginning to the end? Maybe it's a semester, maybe it's a unit, maybe it's a class period. So it's more of that internal motivation. And that, that um, you know, typically starts in about grade four or five. You look at uh, different research and they, they focus on, on motivation and how motivating students plays um, uh, a direct connection in their learning rather than that external motivation, so that in, intrinsic motivation. Um, the greatest impact of feeding occurs, a feedback occurs, remember, when it's supported by effective teaching and effective strategies with that internal motivation. Next one. I, I love this one because this is one that we, we see um, throughout a uh, different classroom. It should be in embedded challenges um, that supports mindsets, mind frames, metacognition, and deliberate practice. And when you looked at practice, remember exposure three to five times of new content for students to learn. But the deliberate practice means that it's spaced, not masked. So again, you don't want to have um, it, it's like best studying before a test. You don't want to cram the night before uh, and hope that you do well on the, the final exam. Space practice over time increases that, that student achievement, along with the metacognition. Do they understand their learning, um, where they're going, their learning targets with that deliberate practice? So again, it's spaced, not masked, when you're practicing in the classroom for any sort of learning. Here's one, and this is um, one that you see all over in education circles, especially lately, that celebrating or normalize, normalizing um, errors or failure. Um, so they call it fail forward, or um, like I said, celebrating those errors. Uh, and, and this is something that's difficult for my sophomore son. Um, he goes to school in a, a standard space grading high school and school has been typically easy for him up until his sophomore year and now he's had to study and he doesn't realize why he's not acing that and not receiving fours on those standards. They go on a, a, on a four point scale um, and it really bothers him. Uh, but what I try to instill in him is if you went into the classroom knowing everything in your advanced math, then what are you doing in that classroom? There should be some failure, some learning taking place. You should not be able to master that learning objective or standard right off the bat. There should be some room for air, some room for growth and moving forward. So I really like this one about normalizing and celebrating airs. It is the key to new learning. This is one that I'm extremely passionate about, especially since it's uh, typically seen K-12 uh, in literacy, um, but it also happens across content areas, uh, is that mixed ability grouping. And what they have found is when you track students or you group them according to their ability, remedial students are kept remedial. Now I know, there is some research out there to support that if you put all the talented and gifted students um, together, their achievement and their learning increases, but it's very minute. All of the other support and studies and research out there show that when you track an ability group students, and I'm not talking about small groups in the elementary classroom, I'm talking about in general, it keeps remedial students remedial. 
why? Well, because for some reason, um, and I'm sure I'll see, a, or, or there'll be a lot of, I won't see it, there'll be a lot of head nodding here, uh, teachers slow down, or they use different content, or um, uh, they do, um, uh, they don't progress as fast as the other classrooms. And when you look at it, those students need lots of practice over and over and over again in short bursts. Instead of slowing or way down and not getting through anything, they need repeated exposure, more practice, more scaffolds. And so they have found that it actually hinders students and drives all students' achievement down. Plus, it's really hard to break those, um, you know, those uh, um, uh, categories or labels that students are given when they're very young. Um, so just because a student struggles in one area of literacy does not mean they struggle with all of it. Um, and that's true for every discipline. So don't ability group, don't track kids. It's bad practice. Yeah, and I just wanted to jump in there real quick. If you can just yeah. go back to that slide. Um, yes. And of course, this webinar is for everybody, not just teachers who might happen to be in a school that's using Hapara. But one of the things Hapara um, does really well is we have a way to set up groups um, within different parts of the product that we have. Um, so yeah, we love that. We love the mixed ability groups and just making that easier for teachers then to deliver materials um, to the groups in different ways. It just makes things easier in the classroom in general. That's right. So differentiate in your classroom. Don't put them in a whole separate class. Um, there's different things. And I think this is one of the advantages of Hapara and EdTech in general uh, about that it allows you to uh, use and target instruction in one class to meet the students' needs of small groups or uh, individuals. Um, and so that's, that's a huge benefit. Uh, for teachers, especially it stays, saves on time and resources. Um, and, and so I'm not saying don't small group, right? I'm saying don't track students and put them in a whole separate classroom. You should definitely differentiate in the classroom. And, uh, you know, if they need the same sort of skill or they're working on the same sort of component, component or standard or content, that's a great group there to collaborate and work together. So I love that. All right, the next one is um, feedback needs to be task related rather than ego related. And this is one that you see not only uh, in teacher feedback, but also peer to peer feedback. So if my students were working um, together, uh, giving each other feedback, before I taught them how to give punctuating feedback or effective feedback, they typically wrote, this is good, it's great. I like this, great job. Um, and so that was really feeding their ego instead of being specific uh, to the task at hand and the actions that they were doing to complete that task at a high level. So feedback needs to be task related rather than ego related. So comments, first grades. Um, I, we looked at that Ruth Butler survey study earlier uh, and, and we found comments increase that student learning and achievement more so than grades because grades, I mean, really, uh, they're so ambiguous. And what does that tell you that the child actually knows? So uh, it used to be thought that the brain reached maximum capacity, I think by age like five or six. That's as much as your brain uh, would develop. And um, what they have found is through brain research, it's malleable and its intelligence is variable. And this no doubt supports the belief that all students can improve um, and achieve at high levels. So it continues to grow and be strength strengthened. It's not fixed. Intelligence is not fixed. Um, and they're unsure of that uh, capacity of, of brain, um, brain growth and, and learning. It's kind of immeasurable right now, um, but they do know that it continues throughout a lifetime. So that it's not, it's definitely not fixed. I always like to stop and pause here and ask 
the group that I'm working with, because as you can imagine, that's lots of discussion and lots of light bulbs and comments um, throughout when we're going through these seven areas. But if you had to rank these in your school or your classroom, which ones do you feel are most important? Which ones do you think def definitely um, you need to have in place to maximize that culture of feedback in the classroom. Um, and then I always put up these uh, seven ideas again. So I, I have them pause, rank them, which one ranks at the top of your list. And of course, everybody says, well, they all do. I wanna put them all at top. But if you had to rank them, um, which ones do you find are most important? So Beth, you've heard this and I'm gonna call on Beth. Um, Beth, what do you think? If you had to rank some up towards the top, which ones do you feel would be, this is definitely a top tier for me? Uh, you're going to put me on the spot here. Um, I would say, I would the, definitely the feedback uh, within the formative assessment framework in the feedback, feedback needs to be task related. I would say those two would probably be at the top of my list. Mm-hmm. I agree. I, I love form and assessment. I, and I would maybe change uh, your second one for me personally. I think underpin them the, in the belief that all students can learn um, at high levels and can improve. That's something, um, and you wouldn't think so, but that's something I've seen across the nation working with different groups of educators. Not everybody thinks that. And it's shocking to me as an educator. Not everybody thinks that all students can improve. And I um, just think in education, to me, I mean, like, I think I'm with you. Like, that's almost like, why would we even not think that? I mean, because that's our job is to help students grow and learn. And it, that's just something that I think as educators, that's, that's like a non-negotiable. <laughs> yeah. I, I know I wouldn't want my child to have a teacher that didn't believe in the power of all students to be able to learn. Yeah. It, it is quite shocking. And then you try to, you know, do a root cause analysis and you try to figure out what's at the root of their beliefs that causes them to think this. Um, uh, but yeah, I agree. And uh, usually that, that formative assessment, that feedback in form assessment, that rings up there pretty high with the group set that I work with. So then everybody says, okay, Shaylin, we've talked about this. Now give us something we can use in the classroom, right? Something that you can use the next day. Um, so these are just three of my very favorite formative assessment um, and feedback strategies. Well, I guess one is, is formative and summative, you could use it, but these are definitely feedback strategies uh, that are some of my favorites that I hope you can take with you and use immediately with Hapara, without Hapara. Um, in the classroom, I hope this is good stuff that you can use um, in feedback, the feedback loop, and uh, in your own classroom. So my favorite feedback strategies. Um, the first one would be rubrics. And I put what we typically know on rubrics to be uh, as holistic and analytic. So if you look at rubric types, holistic is when you look at, um, let's say at the paper as a whole and you give it a grade and you might mark some comments down or write in, in a paragraph, but you're looking at the, uh, the assignment or the task or the paper as a whole. The next one, analytic, is what we typically think of when we hear the word rubric. It's written in levels of achievement in columns, um, an assessment in a criteria rows. It allows you to assess the student's achievements based on multiple criteria in a single rubric. So this is what we typically think of for rubrics is the analytic one. Um, where there's different levels and different components and uh, the criteria is in the rows. My favorite and one that I challenge you to use is called the single point rubric. Beth, have you ever heard of the single point rubric? Um, only about a year ago. Um, and really? you know, I heard, yeah, I had never heard of it before. Um, and I never, I should say I'd never used it before. And then when I started reading about it, I'm like, this really makes sense just because I think about what you're going to explain about what it does, but I think it can really help motivate students to do their best, mm -hmm. not against like a certain set, like here's the bare minimum you need to get to, but I think because it helps push them a little bit further, you know, just it pushes them against themselves, I guess I should That's say. Great. 
And that's interesting that you uh, worded it in, in that way because I love using single point rubrics, not only for um, you know, summative assessment, but also for feedback. So this could be um, uh, self-feedback and reflection. This could be used peer-to-peer -peer feedback um, and, and kind of scaffolds that learning. So there's a lot of uses for single point rubric. And this is um, a, a basic example um, for uh, literacy and, and um, for writing. But what you'll notice is there is one column of proficiency. And when I work with educators setting up their assessment and their rubrics, I always remind them that what you put on a rubric shows students what you value. So if you have a rubric worth 100 points and 50 of that is on double spaced and using a 14 single point font and, and all of this stuff, it shows that you care more about visually how it looks than the content. Um, so where you, you place your emphasis is shows what you value. But the single point rubric, like I said, has a column of proficiency in the center and it displays a set of criteria written with a single level of achievement um, showing quality work. There's no alternative levels and there's an open space, as you'll see in the columns, for feedback, goal setting, or evidence. Older kids, it's great to construct these with them so they get an idea of uh, what it means to be a proficient in organization or voice or convention. Um, younger students, this might be simplified uh, and te more teacher created. Um, but it's great because students then go, can go through and do a self-reflection and evaluation. Am I there yet? Nope. Um, what do I need to do? Am I there yet? Yes. Here's my evidence. Um, and how can I push myself up to that next level? It's also great for peer-to-peer -peer feedback so you don't get that ego-related instead of task-related feedback uh, where they're saying this is good or that's great. They can be specific on, yep, they definitely um, use language that's specific and precise, um, and here's some examples of vivid words and phrases, um, or nope, they haven't reached that yet. They use a lot of cliches and jargon in their, in their writing, and so I, I love using these single point rubrics um, for peer-to-peer for -peer feedback as well. Um, and like I said, I, I think it's definitely one um, of strength that is new to a lot of people. There's a lot of different resources and I know that you're gonna get the slide deck for this and then there's linked um, the resource that, that, I, that I use um, most frequently, but I've created these, everything from an online uh, course on um, infographics, Beth, all the way to social studies doing a whole unit. So single point rubrics are powerful and it's a, a great tool to use not only for summative, but for feedback in the classroom. The last strategy um, that I wanna share that you can use across disciplines and, and um, uh, across grade levels is called the PQP. Have you heard of this one, Beth? Um, I have not. Now, I bet you've heard of variations. Maybe of I called it something else. I, I bet you have. Have you ever heard of um, I think, I, or I see, I think, I wonder? Yes. Yes, okay, so this is a variation of that. Um, and it's called PQP, um, but it's applicable across, like I said, disciplines and grade levels. But the first P stands for praise. And this is, um, again, can be used for reflection or it's very powerful for peer-to-peer -peer feedback. This is where I use it mostly. Um, but the praise stands for what specific did you like? What evidence can you include to point to specific things in their project, in their paper, in their work that you liked? What is it? How do you relate to it? How does it speak to you? Um, so it kind of helps shift it from being this is good work to specifics that they can praise that they like that is ideal. The second one is Q for question. Now this would be, if you look at a writing process, this would be during the revision stage. So questions force um, the, the author, the writer, the student to go back and explain more or expand or word it in a different way or construct more visually to help the reader, the audience, the observer, the viewer understand what they're trying to communicate. So it is, is it's during that phase where they're adding more information to uh, make it understandable um, by the person that is 
that is viewing it. Um, and <clears throat> Uh, more explanation or details needed, more evidence, um, connections to what you said earlier. So that is the question portion of PQP. The last one is polish. Now this is more at the very end of a paper or a project that a student's doing. And um, this deals with what do I need to do before I push this out to its intended audience? So this talks about all of the editing. Um, in, in a writing process or project creation. What needs to happen before someone else sees this? What do I need to go back and, and change? Maybe it's grammar usage and mechanics that should happen at the end. Um, or, uh, you know, maybe it's um, uh, cleaning up lines on an art project um, before it's turned in. Um, so there's different ways to look at polish, but polish means what does it need to do those last little details before it's sent out to its intended audience. So PQP is one of my very favorite strategies. You've heard it before as I see, I think, I wonder, um, a lot of variations, but I love PQP. And I always used it in my classroom because we know it should be embedded in formative assessment as the person, um, the author or the creator, depending on the discipline you are in, is the one who decides what they want feedback on. So if they are not ready to push this out and they only want the P in the cube, that's what they let their partner know. Please give me P in P, feedback on the P and the Q, uh, because this is not ready to be pushed out yet. I'm not even at that point. I just need some more, some more um, opportunities to beat, beef this up. So what do you think about this one, Beth? PQP is a new one for you. You said it yeah, kind of was. I like this. Um, and I think it's so important now, especially since students are, you know, producing work that is intended for more of a global audience. I think they, they definitely would appreciate having some peer-to-peer -peer type feedback and being able to edit and then kind of polish the stone, if you will, before it before it goes out to the audience. That's right. And so, um, you know, when you look at those different strategies um, and you look at uh, students demonstrating their understanding across disciplines, it typically takes the form of writing, right, in some form or fashion, uh, whether it's visual, whether it's an infographic, whether it's a short video, whether it's an essay. Most courses, most discipline, most classes have students demonstrate their under understanding through some sort of written communication. And that is, again, I know um, this is a focus on feedback, but you and I are both ed tech experts. That's kind of the beauty of ed tech. It helps with that feedback loop. It allows students to not only um, use, let's say commenting feature in, in a Google Docs um, or voice um, by leaving a, a voice feedback on a, doc, on a Google Doc, um, but it allows kids to uh, participate in that feedback loop access it at any time, work on their uh, projects at any time. The learning doesn't have to take place just during the class period. Beth? Yeah, I mean, learning can take place anywhere, anytime. And that's, I think, what I find so exciting is that the learning doesn't just happen within the four walls of the classroom anymore. It can be, you know, like I said, 24-7. I just saw a tweet this morning that somebody put out. Um, she had a, a midnight deadline for students to turn in an essay. And she put up a graphic at the times that students were turning things in. And there were a couple of students who turned things in a few days ago and then a few more yesterday. And then midnight was like 90% of the class was yeah. on finishing up between 10 p.m. and midnight last night to get it in by that deadline. And it's just, I think it just goes to show that students definitely, um, their learning does not end uh, when they walk out of the doors at the end of the school day. That's right. So what are some other favorite ed tech um, used for feedback in the classroom? Uh, well, of course, we talked about Google Docs. There's numerous, endless amounts um, of ways to provide feedback using the, the Google Suite and the Google Tools. And I know Hopara um, plays nicely in that environment. Oh, definitely. Um, you know, and of course, Hopara is a dashboard that works with um, Google Drive. So it makes that whole feedback process just so seamless and so easy. And of course, other tools integrate within Hapara very, very well. So we have a lot of our teachers um, who use Flipgrid for all sorts of different things. I mean, Flipgrid's been around for a couple years now and 
it's just so much fun to be able to, you know, for students to give feedback to each other or just like, you know, on here just to reflect on their own learning. So, yeah, so many options. There's too many options to even name. You were brave to pick these. I, I know it. I, I tried to choose ones that maybe knew um, for people. Flipgrid, I, I agree. It's been around for a couple of years and it's just exploded. And so um, that's probably not new to very many people. But if it's new to you, it's a, a video response. Um, and you don't have to show your face. And they have different emojis and icons that you can use to, to decorate that. But basically, at its core, it's a way to video record yourself. Um, and either share your learning or provide feedback. Um, you can hook on links and, and um, you know, to documents or extra learning or, or, or whatnot, but think of it as a, a video recording response system. They have a huge community, lots of um, different examples out there. The other one is Synth. Have you heard of this one, Beth? I have not. You haven't? Ooh, new one for you. So Synth is uh, micro podcasting. So think of it as podcasting like Twitter. Um, you can have conversations and have a threaded uh, feed um, off one synth. So let's say uh, I pose a question to the class. Um, students can get on there and record their voice um, and it becomes like a, a little podcast or you could do it weekly and and it's just, it's something new. It's very user friendly. It works on any device. Um, they have limited uh, production type quality. So it's very easy, simple for kids to use. Um, you can put some music on the beginning, on the end. You can have a, a screenshot or a, a picture to introduce what you're talking about. But it's a great tool to use not only for podcasting, micro podcasting, but also in feedback. So you could share. Um, you could share a question or you could share your project or you could share uh, your writing or your thinking and then have that threaded dialogue of feedback um, for kids to listen to. And I think it's like 250 seconds, I think is a countdown clock, but it's, it's simple to use, very easy. Oh, that sounds, I'm going to check that out. As soon as we get off this today, that's like the first thing I'm going to check out. Really? It's called yeah. Ghost, Ghost Synth um, when you look it up. So, okay. Micro podcasting. Um, screencasting lots of tools out there and then uh, i just put some uh, different things for um, feedback and assessment at the end so clickers that's very low tech um, that's where kids are given the qr code um, and the qr code where you turn it um, on every side of let's say a, a it's typically a square qr code looks like a square shows a different answer so um you know rating yourself uh one to four how um how well do you think you understand this concept today and kids would choose um and then the teacher scans the classroom with with their their mobile device or, or ipad or whatnot and they get an understanding right there so that's that's been around for a very long time but a lot of people are unfamiliar with it all the way down to google forms microsoft forms um, lots of different things that you can use for that feedback in the classroom any you would add beth to that one there's tons there's endless amounts yeah i mean there are definitely so many things that we can use um, in the classroom just to provide feedback and to help teach you know students give each other feedback uh, no I, I google obviously is my favorite just because it's something we use so often in the classroom and it's just the commenting feature in google um, i think is super easy one thing i would like to add if teachers don't know this this is just one of those fun little google tricks if you're leaving a comment for a student and they happen to have gmail i know some schools turn that off but if Gmail is turned on and you tag a student by adding their email address in the comment, um, they'll actually get an email um, letting them know that you have left feedback for them. Nice. So it makes it, draws attention to it. Yeah. But do kids even use email anymore, Beth? <laughs> oh. Sometimes. That's a whole, that's a whole other discussion. Yeah, yeah right? definitely. Yeah, but we do. We, of course, we love um, all of the Google Suite and all of those different resources and tools. It just makes it so simple, accessible. You know, you can use add-ons for text-to-speech, speech-to-text, tons of different things to use um, to provide that feedback and access those comments. So again, um, this is my uh, 
business partner, Stephen Anderson. You may know him as Web20 Classroom, also one of Beth's very good friends. Um, but uh, we are passionate about um, EdTech solutions, especially that uh, integrates nicely with sound pedagogy and instruction in the classroom. Um, we're firm believers that feedback does uh, move students in their growth and their, their learning achievement. Um, but there's different ways to make sure that feedback is effective and like we just discussed, different ed tech to support those, those the feedback in the classroom. So um, again, I'm Shaylin and uh, all of my information is listed. You can reach out to me and on Twitter or email or um, on the blog. And it was great. Thank you, Beth, so much. Thank you, Hapara, for letting me share some of my passion areas. I, I hope that you uh, learned something that you can use tomorrow in your classroom. Well, thank you, Shaylin, so much for joining us. I took copious amounts of notes because I mean, there's so much that you shared that's amazing. So thank you so much for joining us and um, keep an eye out for future webinars from us. Thank you very much. Bye guys.